Harry was rather quiet as he ate the ice cream Hagrid had brought him, chocolate with raspberry and chopped nuts. What's up, said Hagrid. Nothing, Harry lied. They stopped to buy parchment and quills. Harry cheered up a bit when he found a bottle of ink that changed, changed color as he wrote. When they left the shop, he said, Hagrid, what's Quidditch? <laughs> Blimey, Harry, I keep forgetting how little you know, not knowing about Quidditch. Don't make me feel worse, said Harry. He told Hagrid about the pale boy in Madame Malikin's. And he said people from muggle families shouldn't even be allowed in. You're not from a muggle family. If he'd known who you were, he's grown up knowing your name. If his parents are wizarding folk, you saw what everyone in the leaky cauldron was like when they saw you. Anyway, what does he know about it? Some of the best things I ever saw were the ones with magic in them along in a long line of muggles. Look at your mom. Look what she had for a sister. So what is Quidditch? It's our sport, wizard sport. It's like like soccer in the muggle world. Everyone follows Quidditch, played up in the air on broomsticks and there's fall, four balls. It's sort of hard to explain the rules. And what are Slytherin and Hufflepuff? Schoolhouses, there's four. Everyone says Hufflepuff are a lot of duffers, but I bet I'm in Hufflepuff, said Harry gloomily. Better Hufflepuff than Slytherin, said Hagrid darkly. There's not a single witch or wizard who went bad who wasn't in Slytherin. You know who was one. Volt, sorry, you know who was at Hogwarts? Years and years ago, said Hagrid. They bought Harry's school books in a shop called Flourish and Blots, where the shelves were stacked to the ceiling with books as large as paving stones bound in leather, books the size of postage stamps in covers of silk, books full of peculiar symbols, and a few books with nothing in them at all. Even Dudley, who had never read anything, would have been wild to get his hands on some of these. Hagrid almost had to drag Harry away from Curses and counter curses. Bewitch your friends and befuddle your enemies with the latest revenge. Hair loss, jelly legs, tongue tying, and much, much more by Professor Vindictus Viridian. I was just trying to find out how to curse Dudley. I'm not saying that's not a good idea, but you're not to use magic in the muggle world anyway, except in very special circumstances, said Hagrid. And anyway, you couldn't work any of them yet. You'll need a lot more study before you get to that level. Hagrid wouldn't let Harry buy a solid gold cauldron either. It says pewter on your list. But they got a nice set of scales for weighing potion ingredients and a collapsible brass telescope. Then they visited the apothecary, which was fascinating enough to make up for its horrible smell, a mixture of bad eggs and rotted cabbages. Barrels of slimy stuff stood on the floor. Jars of herbs, dried roots, and bright powders lined the walls. Bundles of feathers, strings of fangs, and snarled claws hung from the ceiling. While Hagrid asked the man behind the counter for a supply of some basic potion ingredients for Harry, Harry himself examined silver unicorn horns at 21 galleons each and minuscule glittery black beetle eyes, five nuts a scoop. Outside the apothecary, Harry checked Hagrid's list again. Just your wand left, oh yeah, and I still haven't got you your birthday present. Harry felt himself go red. You don't have to. I know I don't have to. Tell you what, I'll get you your animal. Not a toad. Toads went out of fashion years ago. You'd be laughed at. And I don't like cats. They make me sneeze. I'll get you an owl. All the kids want owls. They're dead useful. Carry in your mail and everything. Twenty minutes later, they left Ilop's Owl Emporium, which had been dark and full of rustling and flickering, jewel-bright eyes. Harry now carried a large cage that held a beautiful snowy owl, fast asleep with her head under her wing. He couldn't stop stammering his thanks, sounding just like Professor Quirrell. Ah, don't mention it, said Hagrid gruffly. Don't expect you've had a lot of presents from them Dursleys. Just Ollivander's left now. Only place for wand, Ollivander's, and you gotta have the best wand. A magic wand. This was what Harry had been really looking forward to. The last shop was narrow and shabby. Peeling gold letters over the door read, Ollivander's, maker of fine wands since 382 BC. A single wand lay on a faded purple cushion in the dusty window. A tinkling bell rang somewhere in the depths of the shop as they stepped inside. It was a tiny place, empty except for a single spindly chair that Hagrid sat on to wait. Harry felt strangely as though he had entered a very strict library. He swallowed a lot of new questions that had just occurred to him and looked instead at the thousands of narrow boxes piled nearly right up to the ceiling. For some reason, the back of his neck prickled. The very dust and silence in here seemed to tingle with some secret magic. 
Good afternoon, said a soft voice. Harry jumped. Hagrid must have jumped too because there was a loud crunching noise and he quickly got off the spindly chair. An old man was standing before them, his wide, pale eyes shining like moons through the gloom of the shop. Uh, uh, hello, said Harry awkwardly. Ah, uh, yes, said the man. Yes, yes. I thought I'd be seeing you soon, Harry Potter. It wasn't a question. You have your mother's eyes. It seems only yesterday she was in here herself buying her first wand. Ten and a quarter inches long, swishy, made of willow. Nice wand for charm work. Mr. Ollivander moved closer to Harry. Harry wished he would blink. Those silvery eyes were a bit creepy. Your father, on the other hand, favored a mahogany wand. Eleven inches, pliable, a little more power, and excellent for transfiguration. Well, I say your father favored it, but it's really the wand that chooses the wizard, of course. Mr. Ollivander had come so close that he and Harry were almost nose to nose. Harry could see himself reflected in those misty eyes. And that's where Mr. Oliver touched the lightning scar on Harry's forehead with a long white finger. I'm sorry to say, I sold the wand that did it, he said softly. Thirteen and a half inches, you powerful wand, very powerful, and in the wrong hands. Well, if I'd known what that wand was going out into the world to do. He shook his head, and then, to Harry's relief, spotted Hagrid. Rubius, Rubius Hagrid, how nice to see you again. Oak, sixteen inches, rather bendy, wasn't it? It, it? it was, sir, yes, said Hagrid. Good wand, that one. But I suppose they snapped it in half when you got expelled, said Mr. Ollivander, suddenly stern. Er, yeah, yes, they did, yes, said Hagrid, struggling his feet. I've still got the pieces, though, he added brightly. But you don't use them, said Mr. Ollivander sharply. Oh, no, sir, said Hagrid quickly. Harry noticed he gripped his pink umbrella very tightly as he spoke. Hmm, said Mr. Ollivander, giving Hagrid a piercing look. Well, now, Mr. Potter, let me see. He pulled a long tape measure with silver markings out of his pocket. Which is your wand arm? Er, well, I I'm right-handed, said Harry. Hold out your arm, that's it. He measured Harry from shoulder to finger, then wrist to elbow, shoulder to floor, knee to armpit, and around his head. As he measured, he said, Every Ollivander wand has a core of powerful magical substance, Mr. Potter. We use unicorn hairs, phoenix tail feathers, and the heart strings of dragons. No two Ollivander wands are the same, just as no two unicorns, dragons, or phoenixes are quite the same. And of course, you will never get good results with another wizard's wand. Harry suddenly realized that the tape measure, which was measuring between his nostrils, was doing this on its own. Mr. Ollivander was flitting around the shelves, taking down boxes. That will do, he said, and the tape measure crumbled into a heap on the floor. Right then, Mr. Potter, try this one. Beechwood and dragon heartstring, nine inches, nice and flexible. Just take it and give it a wave. Harry took the wand and, feeling foolish, waved it around a bit but Mr. Ollivander snatched it out of his hand almost at once. Maple and phoenix feather, seven inches quite would be try. Harry tried, but he had hardly raised the wand when it, too, was snatched back by Mr. Ollivander. No, no, here, ebony and unicorn hair, eight and a half inches springy. Go on, go on, try it out. Harry tried and tried. He had no idea what Mr. Ollivander was waiting for. The pile of tried wands was mounting higher and higher on the spindly chair, but the more wands Mr. Ollivander pulled from the shelves, the happier he seemed to become. Tricky customer, eh? Not to worry, we'll find the perfect match here somewhere. I wonder now. Yes, why not? Unusual combination. Holly and phoenix feathers, 11 inches, nice and supple. Harry took the wand. He felt a sudden warmth in his fingers. He raised the wand above his head, brought it swishing down through the dusty air, and a stream of red and gold sparks shot from the end like a firework, throwing dancing spots of light on the walls. Hagrid whooped and clapped, and Mr. Ollivander cried, Oh, bravo, yes indeed, oh, very good, well, 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 how curious, how very curious. He put Harry's wand back into its box and wrapped it in brown paper, still muttering, Curious, curious. Sorry, said Harry, but... What's curious? Mr. Ollivander fixed Harry with his pale stare. I remember every wand I've ever sold, Mr. Potter. Every single wand. It so happens that the phoenix, whose tail feather is in your wand, gave another feather. Just one other. 
It is very curious indeed that you should be destined for this wand when its brother, why, its brother gave you that scar. Harry swallowed. Yes, thirteen and a half inches, you. Curious indeed how these things happened. The wand chooses the wizard, remember? I think we must expect great things from you, Mr. Potter. After all, he who must not be named did great things. Terrible, yes, but great. Harry shivered. He wasn't sure he liked Mr. Ollivander too much. He paid seven gold galleons for his wand, and Mr. Ollivander bowed them from his shop. The late afternoon sun hung low in the sky as Hagrid and Harry made their way back down Diagon Alley, back through the wall, back through the leaky cauldron now empty. Harry didn't speak at all as they walked down the road. He didn't even notice how much people were gawking at them on the underground, laden as they were with all their funny-shaped packages, with the snowy owl asleep in its cage on Harry's lap. Up another escalator, out into Paddington Station, Harry only realized where they were when Hagrid tapped him on the shoulder. Got time for a bite to eat before your train leaves, he said. He bought Harry a hamburger and they sat down on plastic seats to eat them. Harry kept looking around. Everything looked so strange somehow. You all right, Harry? You're very quiet, said Hagrid. Harry wasn't sure he could explain. He'd just had the best birthday of his life and yet he chewed his hamburger trying to find the words. Everyone thinks I'm special, he said at last. All those people in the leaky cauldron, Professor Quirrell, Mr. Ollivander, but I don't know anything about magic at all. How can they expect great things? I'm famous, and I can't even remember what I'm famous for. I don't know what happens when, well, sorry, I mean, I don't know what happened the night my parents died. Hagrid leaned across the table. Behind the wild beard and eyebrows, he wore a very kind smile. Don't you worry, Harry. You'll learn fast enough. Everyone starts at the beginning at Hogwarts. You'll be just fine. Just be yourself. I know it's hard. You've been singled out, and that's always hard. But you'll have a great time at Hogwarts. I did. Still do, as a matter of fact. Hagrid helped Harry on the train that would take him back to the Dursleys, then handed him another envelope. Your ticket for Hogwarts, he said. First of September, King's Cross. It's all on your ticket. Any problem with the Dursleys, send me a letter with your owl. Show them where to find me. See you soon, Harry. The train pulled out of the station. Harry wanted to watch Hagrid until he was out of sight. He rose in his seat and pressed his nose against the windows, but he blinked and Hagrid was gone. Okay, friends, that's the end of chapter five. I will try to get you chapter six tonight or tomorrow. Love ya.